I might even be further ahead than I am, but God has definitely brought me a long ways and taught me a lot of stuff. And uh, But anyway, I want to start with something funny. I know Dennis loves the, to hear some jokes. I heard this story about this young lady at college, wrote home to her parents and said, Dear parents, said, said there's been a riot, said there's a... Uh, you know, been some fire in the campus and said, you know, unfortunately I got some smoke inhalation damage and said I'm currently in the hospital, but the good news is I've met somebody. I plan to get married. We're going to move to Alaska and start having babies as soon as he's off probation. And uh, and so then at the very bottom of the letter it said, P.S., just kidding, all that was not true. I did fail chemistry. Oh, Amen. So sometimes there's some perspective on things that it could get worse. If you're not careful, but uh, we want to we want to adjust our per, uh, perspective of things. Amen. It, it'll make you view things a lot differently. But I was listening to Brother Charles Stanley, and and I heard a, a scripture, and kind of fits with what I'm I'm talking about this morning. But it talks about how that that Jesus had came and and not just came to give salvation, but he came to give life and life more abundantly. And today I want to share on some things that I believe will create some abundance in your life. Amen. You may have been experiencing some lack in this time of the season that we've got going on. You may have experienced even a layoff or maybe you've gotten sick and you've not been able to, to go to work and that's affected your finances. But I believe that God didn't design us to be living in lack. I believe he designed us to depend on him, and I, I, one of the prayers in the scripture is, is a fellow that's praying, Lord, don't give me too much that I don't depend on you, and don't give me too little that i got to steal. I believe there's a fine line, but I believe the secret is it, not being rich is, money is, people quote that scripture wrong, money is the root of all evil. No, that's not right. Money, the love of money is the root of all evil, and, and when you have that love of money that to the point that you want to become greedy and hold on to it, that's when it becomes a problem. As long as you've got money, that's not the problem. It's when you want to hold on to it and not let it loose that it becomes in control of you. I believe your giving is proof that you've overcame greed. I'll say that again. I believe your ability to give is, is the proof that you have overcame the greed in your life. You've got to get rid of the greed in order to be a giver. Amen. There's a rule for everything. Everything has a seed. Everything. Good seeds for good apple trees and bad seeds for briar patches and poison ivy. Everything is about seed equals harvest. There's one thing that every religion in the world agrees on, and that's seed equals harvest. Some people call it karma. Some people say what goes around comes around. Some people even make a mistake and say you reap what you sow. You see, that's a mistake. Because if you reaped what you sowed, if you planted a simple apple, you'd receive just a simple apple. But that's not the way seed harvest works. You plant a seed, you get a tree full of apples. Amen. Somebody said you can count how many seeds are in the apple, but you can't count how many apples are in the seed. I believe that's very true. We've got to understand the seed harvest. And in my life, I know that seed equals harvest has, has created me uh, to be blessed. Now, this is the thing. You don't sow... Uh, a seed of of money and expect a seed of healing. I believe that can work, but I believe you sow a seed for what you want. You want an orange tree, you sow an orange seed. You want an apple tree, you sow an apple seed. It, whatever seed that you're in need of is the one you need to sow. If you need money, then sow money. If you need a friend, Scripture says make yourself friendly. You need forgiveness, you got to forgive. You need love, you got to sow some love. You want some honor? Maybe you've been tired of folks dishonoring you or disrespecting you. Maybe you hadn't sowed any honor. Maybe you've sowed some seeds of disrespect. Think about what kind of seeds that you're sowing. Pastor Charles Stanley always says one thing I love to quote, and it's that you reap what you sow later than you sow and greater than you sow. It's always bigger. Make sure you remember that. So, number one thing that I've learned is to understand seed equals harvest. Number two, asking is the seed for receiving. Everything has a seed. If you don't ask, you don't really deserve the harvest of receiving. Scripture says we have not because we ask not. I can tell you, you can ask for the smallest thing and God will give it to you. If you acknowledge him in all of your ways, even the smallest thing matters to him. If you lost your car keys, ask him. It's almost instant you'll find it. Lost anything, ask him. Problem is, we wait to the last resort to pray. 
It's like reading the instructions on putting the bicycle together. We wait to the very last moment of putting that bicycle together before we decide to read the instruction, whereas if we had read the instruction, we'd have been a whole lot further ahead down, down the game. Amen. So asking is a seed for receiving. Uh, re- remain humble. One thing I want to talk about asking is, is that when we ask, it's almost a form of humbleness, humility. And I believe that humbleness is a sign of honor. You see, and, and so many times we get prideful and, and, and we don't want to ask. It's almost like it hurts us to ask. I go to my brother's house to visit him, and, and as many times as he has given me a glass of tea or something to eat, I always make it a practice to continue to ask. Now, when I ask my brother, hey, brother, do you mind if I go get a glass of sweet tea? He always ramps and raves. Brother, you know you ain't got to ask. You go make yourself at home. Get whatever you want to. You don't have to quit asking me. You know what? I still ask. No matter how many times he rants and raves, because I understand that when I don't ask, I'm not robbing him of a glass of tea. I'm robbing him of the opportunity to give a gift. And you see, giving is greater than receiving all day long. And when you, when you rob somebody of their ability to give, you took away their blessing. You took, and the blessing, just the feeling of it. I know, you know, if you think about it, that you get a way better feeling and way more memories from giving than receiving. That's why you can remember what you gave present wise to whoever last year, but you might not remember what they gave you. Because in the giving process, you thought about what they may want. You shopped for what they may want. You saved money for what they may want. You, you, you anticipated the day that you would give them and, and to, to imagine their reaction. And you anticipated that day that you did give to receive that reaction. Because it was more enjoyable to give than to receive. Scripture says it's more, you're blessed more to give than to receive. But I believe that asking is a sign of humbleness. And, and, and the scripture says that for the Lord delights in his people, and he crowns the humble with victory. You want to be victorious? Get humble. Amen. <clears throat> it's at number three. It's a, bigger, it's a bigger joy to give than to receive. I already said that it's more memorable. When you're asked, you're acknowledging that you need something that someone else has the ability to bless you with. And unfortunately, sometimes we, we don't want to be less than. We don't want to lift somebody else on the totem pole and, and show them that honor. It, because of our pride, I guess, is, is what keeps us from doing that. But the truth is, is that when you acknowledge that everyone has some, something that you need, you'll be better off. You see, I have received a lot of paychecks in the mail. I've got a lot of weekly paychecks. But you know what? Not ever has my paycheck been signed from your Holy One, God in heaven. Matter of fact, the return address on the envelope has never said 1010 Gold Street, Heaven's Paradise, zip code 30123. It never had that on there. It's always been through a person that God has orchestrated to bless me in my life. You got to realize that we are the hands, we're the feet, we're the mouthpiece of God, and, and, and others are that way. And, and that's where we get our blessings. So remember to remain humble and always remember that somebody else has something that you may be in need of. Always remember that. Number four, honor is the secret to living longer, to living more abundantly, to being blessed. I believe that honor and dishonor is, is another kind of like a law of gravity. It's, it, go, it ties hand in hand with seed equals harvest because I believe that you could trace a guy's success in his life based on one person that he decided to honor. You could also, on the other hand, probably trace somebody's life that was a failure back to one person that they chose to dishonor. It's all about honor. It's all about dishonor. <clears throat> you know, we talk honor and one of my favorite scriptures is Ephesians 6 1 through 3 and, and children I want you to listen to this because and women and, and everybody I want you to listen to this because we study how to eat healthy and we study how to do exercise and and live longer and then today I'm studying I'm, I'm teaching you on how to have a life that's that's full of abundance but the, but the one thing that scripture says here is in, in Ephesians 6 1 through 3 is children obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, number one. That's what God's children's children do. For this is the right thing to do. But it says to honor your mother and your father. This is the first commandment with a promise. 
The first commandment with a promise. Basically, a promise is a reward for an instruction. If you do this instruction, you'll reap this reward. What is the promise? The promise is, is that if you honor your mother and your father, that things will go well for you, and you'll have a long life on earth. You want to live life long? Honor your mother and your father. You want to have a life of abundance? Honor your mother and your father. Now, I believe God pointed that out to take place in the home first because that's where it has to be taught in the home as a child. But I believe it carries on. You see, if I wrote my own verse of the Bible, the Caleb International Version, it would say if you honor your, your boss man or your customer, if you're in business for yourself, that paychecks will be added unto you. I know that's the Caleb International Version. That's not really in the Bible. But that's a lesson that I have learned in my life. If you show honor to your boss, work hard. You can show honor in a million ways, and I'm going to go into that. But you'll have life and life more abundantly. Amen. I, number five, I believe you should make up ways to honor. Make it up continually. Find more ways to show honor. Picking up trash, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day, I gave somebody a ride, and, and when they got out, they had left their water bottle and their cookie wrapper and something else in my truck, and I just looked over, and it was, you know, I cleaned it up, wasn't a big deal, but I got to thinking, man, that's the opposite of what I would do. Even my own brother, the guy who I told you says, make yourself at home, do what you don't have to ask. Even my own brother, when I ride in his truck, before I get out, I look inside to see what I may have left. And I clean it up. And guess what? I don't just clean up my own water bottle and my own potato chip bag. I look around to see if he's got some in there that he's left. And I clean that up for him because that's a sign of showing honor. My daughter and I were at a stop sign the other a while back, and, and it, it was really the other person's time to go. But I stopped and flagged him on in. And uh, my daughter spoke up and said, Daddy, it was your turn to go. I said, I know it was. But I was planting a seed of honor. Because maybe one day I'm in a hurry and somebody might let me out if I've sown a seed first. You see, everything is seed harvest, seed harvest, honor, dishonor, honor, dishonor. Can't say it enough. Find ways to show honor. Pick up trash in somebody else's vehicle if they give you a ride. Some of these things I'm teaching you today should be common sense and should not have to be taught. But unfortunately, I see so many human beings that live with dishonor. And then they wonder why they have lack. They wonder why they don't live in abundance. They wonder why they have these struggles when there's just some small things that's just a sign of humbleness. You see, picking up trash, that's the last job you want to get. To. If you say, oh, when we was kids, we'd, we'd tease, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to work on a trash truck. Well, now I know trash truck people make a lot of money. But it was the humbleness of picking up trash that, that people didn't want to do. They didn't want to humble themselves. But I believe you should humble yourself in so many ways. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples in showing that he was willing to serve and shown that he was the humble one in the crowd. You see, feet back then was nastier than today. Back then, they didn't have socks and shoes. They might not even took a bath for a few weeks. And they walked around in whatever, camel dung or whatever they may have been walking around in, I'm sure. So feet was pretty nasty. I don't think they had odor eaters. I don't even think they had athletes' feet cream. I think it was plum nasty. But Jesus did it. You see, he was willing to serve. He was willing to humble himself, I believe, because he was teaching us the importance of remaining humble. Don't get too big-headed. Amen. Continually find ways to show more, more honor. When me and my wife go walking on the town, she's constantly picking up trash on the sidewalk. By the time we get home, she's got a whole handful of trash if we didn't find a dumpster on the way. She don't have to do that, but she's showing honor to our community. You see, we forget to show honor to our community. We think it's just an individual person. But I believe we should show honor to everybody uh, around us. Number six, go the extra mile. I can't talk about this one enough. So many times we live in a society where we want to brag about being able to get by with talking on the phone. I was at the dollar store yesterday, and the poor old guy, I had four items and i kept telling the guy I had four had three here and one there and he's on his phone and by the time he gets done i told him i'm telling you four times at least that i had four items and by the time he got done he'd only rung up three it's because he wasn't listening he wasn't paying attention he was preoccupied doing something else i really don't think the guy will get a raise from dollar general by being distracted and, and not being solely focused 
You see, I don't think that's the way it works. You, you don't talk on the phone. Wait till you're off the other man's clock. In my opinion, if you're working for me and you're on the phone or doing anything else except solving a problem from me, you're stealing from me. And if I catch you doing that, most of the time I'll, I'll give a, a, a physical example by pulling my billfold open and saying, hey, do you want to take any more out? And they'll say, what? I took no money from your billfold. Yeah, you did. You're on my paycheck, you're on my clock, and you're on the phone. Why don't you just take it straight out of my billfold? It'll save me from turning in your hours. That was a lie. It'll save me from paying my secretary who wrote your check. It'll save me a lot of wear. Just take it straight out of the billfold. Oh, oh, I wasn't doing that, boss. Well, you were. If you was doing anything else except working, solving a problem for the guy paying you a paycheck, you're a thief. Thieves don't get blessed. I'm sorry. You're basically a thief is trying to bless himself, and when we try to bless ourselves, we're taking that position away from God. That's the only blessing you're going to get is the one that you bless yourself with. And I can tell you, you cannot bless yourself as much as God in heaven can bless you. Amen. So, anyway, go that extra mile. I tell the story of, of how my father taught me this. Uh, when I was cutting grass, I was too embarrassed to ask for money. And he one day said, hey, why are you so embarrassed to ask for money? I don't know, Father. I was just embarrassed. He said, well, how about this? How about you do a little extra? And when you go ask for your $10 for cutting the grass, say, hey, you know, I cut your grass. You owe me $10, but I cleaned you gutter, and you don't owe me a dime, and that's your gift. You say, I believe you should give a gift. And in doing so, going that extra mile, it made me proud to ask for the paycheck. Because at that moment was the same moment I was able to tell them I just gave them a gift. I just blessed them. I just went that extra mile. I gave them more than they were expecting. And I believe in my 45 years, that's been a secret to me being blessed. Number seven, be a team player. If you think Corona is contagious, spirits are even more contagious. Married couples, I'm sure, can vouch for this like crazy, but everybody should be able to. When your wife's not feeling good, guys, it don't take but one look at her to be like, uh-oh, I'm not feeling good either. It's contagious. Spirits are contagious, more so than the corona, I can tell you. Uh, but surround yourself with people who, who build you up, who lift you up, who encourage you, who have the spirit that you want to have because that's the one that you're going to catch. Mama said birds of a feather flock together. If you lay with the dogs, you're going to get some fleas. Pick your friends wisely. Surround yourself wisely with folks who are successful. And I'm not just talking about financially. I'm talking about people who live a life of peace and joy and health and abundance in so many other ways besides financing. But remember, their attitudes are so contagious. Check your attitude. <clears throat> Check your attitude because attitude will determine your altitude. It'll determine your altitude. Uh, and, and so, number eight, I'll, I'll move on. Work with a smile. I believe this is so, in, so important. Be enjoyable. Be a thermostat, not just a thermometer. You see, so many people want to go into a room and measure the temperature and respond to that temperature, maybe even talk about that temperature, but do nothing at all to change the temperature. You see, a thermostat controls temperature, and I believe that we as ambassadors of, of the kingdom, as representatives of the kingdom, have some power in our hands to change things, and one of them is the, the atmosphere. I believe atmosphere is so important. My father will not, he'll eat bad food at a restaurant with good atmosphere before he'll eat good food at a restaurant with bad atmosphere. He loves atmosphere. Atmosphere creates so much. Clean your room at night. Get all your clothes put, around, put away and, and see if you don't wake up in the morning happier. Matter of fact, instantly, there's an instant sense of gratification just by getting your life in order. You wake up in the morning, your, your room is messy, you're, you can't find your clean socks, you got to wear the cleanest of the dirty that's in the pile, and that's not enjoyable at all. That's not enjoyable. You're frustrated. You start off with frustration that day, and it leads all the way through the rest of the day. I love to tell the story about my wife. She's so organized that in my closet, I know my, my, wife, uh, my blue sh Short sleeve shirts are here. My blue long sleeve shirts are here. My my yellow short sleeves are here. My yellow long sleeves and so on and so forth. But it's been that way for 11 years. And only one time, I, 
lately with the baby did I ever run out of a clean pair of socks. I had an, I did have another pair, but my favorite socks were not washed. But only one time in 11 years has she ever let me run out, and it was just because there was a lot going on. But she keeps me organized to the point that I can literally, and I did this test with Kaylee. I was my daughter. I was I was showing her the importance of of things being organized, and I made her blindfold me, and I went into the closet. I said, "Okay, Kaylee, tell me what shirt you want me to pick out." She said, "Huh?" So she told me, and I'd pull it out. She'd tell me another, and I'd pull it out. I did all that with my eyes closed. I did not have to look because that organization was always there. Well, guess what? The day I ran out of socks, I was frustrated. Any other day besides that, the clothes or finding clothes was never a source of my frustration. There's some frustrations that we can eliminate on our, in our own power that we don't have to pray about. It's just a matter of doing a little work. Amen. Get organized. See if your atmosphere doesn't change by being organized, by being prepared. Uh, but work with a smile. Uh, let's see here. Number nine, th this is another thing I learned. There is value in your difference. Value lies in your difference. You want to be different? A lot of people want to be different. Last time I shared some of this, I think Mike and Pat's granddaughters had blue hair and orange hair or something. They were definitely different. There's a lot of ways you can be different just by coloring your hair or wearing something different. But I believe your attitude should be different. I believe that what comes out of your mouth should be different. I believe you should use manners. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Because especially these days, that is going out the window. People don't say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. But I can promise you in my life, I have seen where those manners being used has created value in my life. My wife and I were in New York not long ago, and and uh, and we were saying yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I think it was New York, one of those states up north. And and the lady at the campground said, "Are you in the military?" To my wife, and she said, "No." She said, "You're not from around here, though, are you?" Said, no. She said, I knew just by the way you talked. You see, our yes, ma'am, and our no, ma'am creates a difference, and there's value because when they think you're in the military, they think it, you're manner mannerful. Uh, full of manners, uh, they treat you different. You get favor of God, like you want favor of God, start doing some things that God taught you, but you'll create the favor of God on your life simply by your manners, your mannerism. Be different. Yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am goes a long ways. Amen. Number 10, I believe you should heal relationships quickly. Uh, offer lots of forgiveness because you'll need it. For me, I definitely need lots of forgiveness. So I must offer lots of forgiveness. Again, remember the seed and the harvest. If you ain't got it together, you better be pretty forgiven. You better quit criticizing folks and holding unforgiveness. Amen. Because uh, you're going to create some problems. <clears throat> and here's your little key. You want to you have some forgiveness and, and heal some relationships. This is a little wisdom note I made. Once you realize how hard it is to change yourself... You should, it, it should, create you to have more mercy on others. Amen. Quit beating up on somebody that's messed up. Quit, quit criticizing somebody that don't have it all together. Uh, uh, because if you realize just how hard it is to change yourself, it ought to be obvious. Give them a break, dude. For me, I know i got to give a break because I know it's hard for me to change uh, some of my ways. Amen. But heal relationship. Admit to mistakes and ask forgiveness as quickly as possible. There's three phrases I wrote down that, that I love to use that I, I think always, almost always heals relationships. And that is, you're right, I'm wrong, please forgive me. Just admit you made a mistake. Even if the other guy wasn't exactly right, tell him he is. And ask him to forgive you. Uh, because you definitely played a part, you play a part in every situation. Amen. <clears throat> Be a peacemaker. God said, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, scripture says, that's in Matthew 5, verse 9, and I, and I read from the Amplified because it really uh, emphasizes some words, but it says blessed, and in parentheses, it says enjoying enviable happiness. You're going to be so blessed with so much happiness 
that, that you're going to basically be a guy that people envy. Why is he so happy? They'll get mad at you for being happy. I've experienced that one too. But you'll bless also means spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and his salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the makers and maintainers of peace, for they shall be called the sons of God. As children of God, as ambassadors of the kingdom, as representatives of the kingdom, we've got a duty. And that duty is to enjoy some enviable happiness, to live in some blessings and some prosperity, uh, to, to, to be a different. See, I believe that, that God designed us so that people will look at us and want to be like us if we really are living in God's will. And that alone is the attraction for the non-Christian to want to find out how to become a Christian. God wants you to be blessed. I, I love to give the demonstration that if I put my children on the stage and they had holes and they looked all rough and beat up in their clothes and maybe their hair wasn't combed out and had a bath in three weeks, you wouldn't really admire me as a parent. But if I got them up here in three-piece suits, their hair was combed, whatever, looking good and smelling good and talking good, you'd be like, that guy's got it going on. His kids are trained. They're looking good. Man, we ought to learn what that guy's doing because his kids are blessed. Well, I believe our Heavenly Father also has that desire that we are so blessed that we have a, a, a prosperity, a happiness that is enviable. Folks want to know how we got it, and then at, that opens the door for us to share the, the gospel of, of Christ, the good news. Amen. 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 These days, for sure, we need lots of peacemakers. My goodness, there is so much tension in the air from racist stuff to what color you are to who you voted for for i mean there is some serious tension and it's just people wearing stuff on their heads on their shoulders looking for a reason to have a fuss well, i believe you're you can be different because there's so many looking for a reason to fuss you look for a reason to create some peace you know i've got a guy that works for me the other day he had a little struggle with a, another contractor and they was about to go at swinging and I stepped in and said, whoa, 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 let's talk about this. What's going on? Well, he said this to me in a, in a tone that was unacceptable. And I said, you know, who knows what that guy was facing that day. Maybe he had something going on. Maybe goldfish died. Who, who knows what happened to the poor guy. But give him a break. And sow that seed because you're going to need a break one day yourself. Do you know in just about five or ten minutes I had them boys friends again and when i finished we all held hands and prayed that bad experience that that thing that could have been a fight actually was an opportunity was an opportunity to to be blessed because scripture says blessed are the peacemakers but, but they shall inherit the kingdom the kingdom's not just salvation it's just not eternal life it's all of the things it's all of the promises that go along with with us when we obey God scripture says that the that God takes great pleasure great pleasure in the prosperity of his saints he wants to see us he gets happy when we get blessed amen, amen. <clears throat> and one way to be blessed is to be a peacemaker find a way to step in and settle the difference Find, I, if we all did this, we might heal our country. I don't know. Might heal our world. I could imagine if we all took it to that level. Amen. But we are supposed to be peacemakers. We need lots of you today. Uh, I had a struggle with a superintendent just this past week. And, uh, and I popped off some dishonorable stuff. I questioned a rule that he just made up, basically. And it, and I really felt like I was in the right. I, looking back at it, I might even still say I was right. But the, but the deal where I was wrong was I, I let my little mouth show some dishonor. And I thought about it. I thought, number one, all of my guys just seen me as a leader lose it. So the first thing I had to do was turn around and, and say, hey, guys, listen up for a minute. I apologize for what you just seen out of me. I did not act right. I let my little emotions come out and i should not have and i can't tell you guys to keep your emotions intact if i don't so please forgive me and please don't do what i just did then the next moment that i was able to see the superintendent i said listen i apologize i should have never disrespected you that way i should have just said yes sir and left it alone i should have not gave you any back talk and guess what i i was a peacemaker because we became friends again we were friends before then but boy i mean i could have snapped it off in a second 
by being dishonorable. But I knew God showed me where, hey, that's not right, Caleb. <laughs> check yourself. Amen. Sometimes we need a check up from the neck up. Amen. Amen. But understand that dishonor can cost you more than you can imagine. I don't know that it, it would have went this far, but that superintendent could have talked to his boss, who talked to their boss, and talked to my boss in Walmart. Before you know it, that thing could have blew up way out of proportion. And who knows, I could have lost my contract. I could have, if nothing else, lost my friendship. If nothing else, I lost the peace for the next time I'm on the same job with that superintendent. Amen. And, and I'm always, we, our jobs are about 10 weeks apiece. If you make an enemy on week number one, you got nine weeks of hell to live in for the rest of the job. You want to make peace and keep peace all the way through if you plan to enjoy that job. I don't know about you, but I do not like living in, in chaos. And uh, that's not the word I'm looking for, but just the stress that somebody in the room don't like you. I don't like that. I like to be liked. I'm a people pleaser. Amen. But uh, understand that dishonor can cost you more than you can ever imagine. Any, it, this is a little wisdom key. I love to quote Mike Murdoch. But anything that you dishonor, you repel. Anything that you honor, you attract. Think about it. You honor a friend, you treat him good, he's probably going to want to hang around with him. You dishonor him, he's probably not going to be a friend, and he definitely don't want to, honor, he don't want to hang around with you anymore. Anything you honor, you attract. Anything you dishonor, you repel. So be careful. Make sure you show an honor. Number 11, continually sow seeds that will create a harvest. I had a garden last year, and uh, it started off kind of small. And But as I began to plant, I realized I wanted to plant some more and kept extending our garden, kept planting. But, you know, as often as, as many times as I planted, something always came up. Everywhere I planted, something came up. And I was looking for more places to plant so that I could have more coming up. I had to keep clearing the grass and keep extending it. But I, I believe that you should continually sow seeds that will create a harvest. Uh, where, wherever you go, plant seeds of joy, of peace, of happiness, of money, of whatever, help. Uh, people on the side of the road have a flat tire. I was in Miami not long ago, and... Me and Richard Youngblood was there. Some of you know Richard. And, uh, and we stopped to help one guy with a flat tire. We stopped to help another person with the, with the gas can. And even in Miami, it was kind of a similar story as the woman I told you about in New York who looked at us and said, y'all are not from here, are you? They knew just by stopping to help that that was not what people around that area were doing to the point they assumed we were strangers to the community. You see, I believe we're strangers to the community here on earth as Christians. I believe we should be so different that they ask us, where do we come from? What's different about you and your life? Who is your father? Our he my heavenly father. How are you willing to help and so many other ones aren't? Well, I can tell you, I want to sow as many seeds as I can because if I need help changing a flat tire and I've helped somebody change a flat tire, I can expect somebody to stop and help me change my tire. You have a right to expect if you do certain things. Amen. I believe you should expect. I believe that's the definition of faith. Amen. But don't expect a seed to come up that you've not planted. That's insanity. The only seed guaranteed to not come up is the one you never planted. That's the only one guaranteed not to come up. Now, you've planted some, and I've planted some I'm sure we're not proud of, and we're praying for God to cancel the harvest. That's those bad seeds. But the good seeds, you need to expect some good things. Amen. Ask yourself, uh, you want a big garden or you want a little garden? That all determines how many seeds you plant. You want a big blessing? You sow a big seed. It's easy math. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 9, 16, said, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously... We'll get a generous crop. Amen. Big garden or little garden? It's your question. It's your decision. I love this. I love to talk about this one, especially in these times we live in now because so many things can cost you and can rob you and can keep you held down during the times we live in with lack of work and having to stay home for the corona. 
But if you read Malachi 3.10, this is a way that you can p- protect your investment. Pastor Rusty shares his investment has been protected of his retirement. But here's the one you can, you can know that's going to help you have some insurance, help, help you have some protection, uh, is Malachi 3.10. In Malachi 3:10, this is the one I love because it's, this is one of the only the, the scripture I read earlier was the one the first promise the, uh, the first instruction that had promise. This is the one that I that I, only one I know of that says put God to the test by doing this instruction. And it, you, so many people say, God, if you're real, do this. God, if you're real, do this. Well, here's you one. God, if you're real, let's do this. Malachi 3:10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So that there be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up a wind, open up the windows of heaven, plural, for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to contain it. You see, I think this is where we start giving is when our cup is full, the overflow is where we give out of it. So your cup shouldn't just be full. It should be overflowing because that's where you give. You give off of the saucer, if you will, below the coffee cup. You don't give out of the coffee cup. But if you exercise what God said here, there's going to be some some in the saucer, not only in the coffee cup. Amen. <clears throat> you won't have room enough to, to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. God said this. I didn't. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and diseases your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed. Not just you calling yourself blessed. Folks around you is going to call you blessed. Even from other nations is going to say that dude is blessed. If you do this scripture, it's conditional. You don't have to if you don't want to, but if you want to see some results, do it. God said, try me, put me to the test. All the nations will call you blessed for your Lord for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's army. You, wanna, you want some lands that are full of delight? Just do Malachi 3.10, amen? <clears throat> I said it will ago, but I'll say it again. Your willingness to be a giver is proof that you have overcame greed. You want to get blessed, you got to get rid of the greed. There's no way you can outgive God, so if you gave it all, you're going to be fine. I tell the story about me giving 10% on the gross and how that just does not make sense mathematically. But guess what? God is continually increasing my giving ability every week. It is continually going up, up, up. I pray I can remain faithful all the way to the top in giving my 10% on my gross and not 10% on my profit, which is a whole lot bigger if you know business. But your willingness to give, amen. Uh, giving and sowing creates an environment for blessings to live in. I love to tell the story of the Dead Sea. You see, the Dead Sea receives water from, a, from at least one inlet, inlet, several the way I understand. But do you know that not a single source of water flows out of the Red Sea, uh, the Dead Sea? It, that's why it collects salt. Nothing in the Dead Sea can live because there's no flow of water going back out it's only flow of coming in so basically the red sea is a taker 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 never a giver 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 that's why nothing can live in that environment if you're always taken and you're never given you may be creating an environment that nothing can live in especially blessings be careful don't be the dead sea amen it only takes and does not give god gives us the desires of our heart I love this, and, I, and, and that can be interpreted a couple of ways. I used to interpret it, Lord, I want a full winner. You said you'd give me my, the desires of my heart. I want a new truck. You said you'd give me the desires of my heart. And he does. He gives you all of that. But I believe that God creates in you what it is that you want. That's really the, the desires that I believe he creates in you. When you start serving God the way that we should serve God, you should, cre- you should develop a desire to be a giver, a desire to be a healer, a desire to be a peacemaker, a desire to be a blessing, a desire to be what God has called us to be. That's the desires I believe God will give you in your heart. And if he gives you a desire to be a giver, guess what? He'll give you something to give. 
Scripture says that he gives seeds to the, sow, to the, to the sower. If you want to be a sower, he'll give you seeds to sow. But I don't believe you should be a blessing just for you to be blessed. I believe we are blessed to be a blessing. I know I'm blessed because there's so many people below me that depend on me to be a blessing. Now, I could complain about that, and I have, in fact, complained about that. And I, I had to ask myself, uh, I had to ask God to forgive me because, really, I would rather be the guy that's being took advantage of by somebody coming and asking for something and me giving than to be the guy that they don't, have to, they don't come ask because they know I ain't got nothing. They don't come bother me because they know I ain't got nothing to give no way. I'd rather be the guy complaining I gave too much. Went to, went to Africa with Shane and I gave it all away in the few, first few days. And she said, slow your old man. We got two weeks to go. But, uh, but I will. I'll give it all away. Matter of fact, I came home hoping I could hit the lottery to go back to Africa to give it all away. I really needed a whole lot more money. They, they better not put me in a position to, uh, like Biden to be able to give money to other countries because I'd give it all away. Poor old America would be upside down. But uh, anyway, uh, because I'm a giver, and I know you can't outgive God. But, uh, but I believe God will give you that. De- if you have the desire to be a blesser, not just to be blessed, but, but to be able to bless, I believe God will give it to you. And I hope today's message is going to create some, some new desires to say, you know what, I want to be like Caleb. I want to I do what God has shown Caleb to do. I want to be that, that giver. When I was a kid, my, I, we had children's church, and I remember we had the boys against the girls in what was called the penny parade, and, and we was going to go on some kind of excursion somewhere to, uh, if the boys won or if the girls won, they were going to go on an excursion. You know, I went out and worked myself extra hard, cutting grass. Buddy, I made sure the boys won. I'm pretty sure I was solely responsible for the boys to win because when the other kids was giving pennies, I was giving hundred dollar bills. I mean, I was really working to win, and we did. But it was not just the desire to go on that excursion. There was something in me that I just, well, I wanted to win. Number probably the first thing, but second thing, I loved to give, and I loved to be the guy that was able to make it happen. We were raising money for something, and I know I contributed enough out of my own finances to make that happen. So my desire started as an early kid. Now, I believe that desire was created from my mother and my father. i tell you all that story about how that so many preachers have bad reputations for just wanting your money, money, money. And the truth was is my mother and father had me given at age two, and if that was the case, they just wanted my money. They were pretty bad people, but that was not the case. They were wanting my money to teach me how to be blessed. They don't want your money. Thank you for your money and all your support. Lights wouldn't get paid without your money. But that's not what we're here teaching you when we teach you about the the principle of seed harvest. I'm not about to, we probably need to take up an offering, but my intention for this message was not to get a bigger offering this morning, okay? I promise you that. My intention this morning was to create, to teach you what I've learned in 45 years so that you can give a bigger offering if you tap into what I've tapped into. If you so desire, but you may not want a big garden. You may want a small one. I don't know. That's our choice. Scripture said we had a choice. That's your choice. But if you want to be like me and have that enjoyable, and I can tell you it feels a whole lot better being a giver than a receiver, a whole lot better, amen, uh, I personally had a desire to be the number one giver, and I, I believe I, I succeeded uh, at least in the penny parade. Amen. Uh, my mother and father, the biggest givers I've ever make uh, ever met, they give it all away. My poor old mama chases my daddy around, saying, "Daryl, do you know we don't have no money?" No, <laughs> but somehow we've lived that whole life. Daddy, Daddy was the balloon trying to float, and Mama was a string holding him down. But they made it. Uh, but it was all about giving. And, and but, but now I look at my mother as much as she kept my father in a, in accountability. If y'all go upstairs and see all the little junk she's got up there, it ain't because she wants it. It's because she wants to give it away. Because she gets enjoyment out of giving it away. She loves to be the person to meet your needs. I don't care if you're a kitty cat or a dog. She'll find a way to feed you. Because she feeds all the neighborhood cats and dogs. I know my mother and father love to give and they love to be a blessing. It's a desire that's in their heart. And I believe God made it possible because of the desire that was in their heart. Amen. 
I get happy uh, when I give. This year, I learned how much I gave my some of my employees, and I was like, "We gave that. We paid that much out this year, huh?" And uh, one guy in particular made a whole lot of money, and uh, more than folks that went to college. Some of them, I'm sure. But you know what? I didn't get a feeling of hurt knowing I paid out that much money, which I'm sure some people probably, and I may have used to also. But this day that I live in, I actually got happy. I actually went to him and said, hey, you realize how much money you made this year? God is really blessing us. And I believe because I'm sowing my seed off of my top, my gross, not my profit. I tell my guys, I'm, I'm sowing your tithes for you. Y'all may not be tithes payer, but I'm paying it for all of us. I believe that really works. I believe the people around me are being blessed. I told you about spirits being cont- contagious. I believe that, that other things are contagious. Uh, blessings especially are contagious. But I get happy uh, knowing that I've, I've given a, give, a, a big gift. When my mother gives me the statement from how much we've given to the church, I get happy. I don't get sad. I don't think, man, what could I have done differently with that money? Don't even cross my mind anymore because I know it's the only reason I got money is because I was a giver. Amen. Number 12, trust God in the dark places. Man, we're living in an age that could be considered very dark. But I can tell you that some of my most memorable and enjoyable experiences happened in the dark place. Some of the t- and I, I know it's because you get close to God. You depend on God. See, see, Scripture says that when we're weak, He's strong. When we're in that weak time, we can really see His power start performing and His ability start creating some things in our life that we need. And, uh, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, I lost my place there. But this time that we live in, uh, bad days will make you appreciate some good days. I think it's important that we have a bad day every day, every now and then, just so we can be ready to give God some thanks and some appreciation for the good days. Amen. But even on those bad days, find yourself growing in your faith with God. Find yourself getting close with Him. Find yourself depending on Him more and see if that's not some of the most memorable and enjoyable experiences you've ever had. When you don't know where the food's coming from, and it still shows up. When you don't know how you're going to pay your light bill, and somehow it manages to happen. Man, that's just some awesome stuff. I, that's just some, I could go on and on and on and on. But, but appreciate those good days. In, in Scripture, James 1, verse 2 through 4 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, that don't make no sense to me until you've lived it then you can make some sense out of it. But it says, take uh, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. They're like, man, that's going to hurt. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. When you realize that you're going to be okay in the dark spot regardless then you can be like Paul. You can be content without, and you can be content with. You can, you can be happy when you, ain't, you don't have nothing, and you can be happy when you have everything. But the main thing there that, that is the secret is that it creates you to depend on God, to trust God. And that's all God wants. God wants a relationship that we can depend on Him. Uh, and as a father, I tell you, I love to feed my dogs and feed my kids and my my wife got on to me the other day i told y'all that i love to get down and eat with my dogs i really don't eat the dog food y'all i just get down and kind of become a threat to the dog and he gets a little worried and he starts eating i don't actually eat i just get down there beside him but but i get happy watching him eat i get happy watching my kids eat i get happy watching my kids have fun and and be joyful as an earthly father Scripture says we know how to give gifts. How much greater does our earthly father know how to give give good gifts? If your children ask for a a piece of bread, you don't give them a snake. I don't remember how the Scripture goes, but it just don't happen that way. And if I'm that somewhat good of a man, we know our heavenly father is definitely good. Amen. But trust God. 
when he gives you a promise, hold on to it. There was some times when, when man, I was sure we was going to be bankrupt and upside down and never, never live again. We was going to just dry up and go away. But God had given me some promises, some prophecies from, from my father and other prophets of God, but not only from them, but from, from some scriptures. Find you some scriptures that you can hold on to. Find you some scriptures that you can hold on to, like the one I just shared with you, that God takes great pleasure in the prosperity of his saints. Know that, hey, God wants me to prosper, and he's got the power to do it. Just relax in that, knowing that God wants to take good care of you. Not just care of you, but good care of you. Amen. Number 13. We'll try to run through this. I'm running out of time. Be thankful. Scripture says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Do you know what praise is? It's basically being thankful. That's, that's what it is. So if we have that attitude of gratitude I told you about a while ago, that's really praising God. It says, be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. I don't care how many times you have messed up, his mercy is endless. goes on and on and on and on. And, and, and me personally, I know when I mess up, man, I don't even, today I struggled getting up here because I know I've messed up. Every time I get up here, I'm shaking like a leaf because, man, I don't think I need to be here. I've got so many, i got more sins than y'all do probably, I don't know. But I know I ain't perfect, dude. By no means. And so, but what I've made a decision is I'm going to tell you about how imperfect I am to give y'all some hope uh, because I am a master of mistakes. I have done plenty of them. But I do know that thankfulness is so powerful. Matter of fact, a wisdom key that I can share with you is this one, is that thankfulness will protect you from dishonor. I shared about dishonor and honor and, and seed and harvest. You want to know how to protect yourself from dishonor? Get thankful. If you get thankful for your boss, it'll seal your lips from mouthing off to him when you appreciate him. If you're thankful for your wife, it'll seal your lips from mouthing off to her and treating her bad. If you're thankful from, for whatever it is, it will protect you from doing something that's going to mess it up. The moment you're not thankful is when your mouth will just fly off. Sometimes we're thankful or, or we should be thankful and, and, and we just forget to be thankful. But uh, I'm telling you if, you, if you lose it and you, and you have some dishonor, it could create some serious failure. So be thankful. <clears throat> Show ways of thankfulness. We give a fruit basket to my boss every, every month. We try to make it at least once a month. We give a fruit basket. I don't know that any other, I've not heard of anybody else giving fruit baskets to the same guy. But I can tell you, because of that once a month gift, I'm pretty sure we're memorable. I know that God has paved the way with favor because of that. Just a small gift that's just a sign of honor. This Christmas, I bought two pretty large presents that I'm going to give to him, large in my mind. The truth is, if you if you did it in ratio of what they have blessed me with all year, it's pennies on a dollar, or pennies on a hundred dollar maybe. It's not much at all. But give gifts, not just physical gifts, fruit baskets and, and that kind of thing, but give gifts of, of just being a, a guy of excellence in your workplace. Amen. Number 14, i got to move on. Work hard, don't be lazy. Proverbs 10.4 says that lazy people are soon poor, but hard workers get rich. It's an easy equation, fellas. You want to be lazy, don't plan on having a lot in the bank. I believe your bank account is a direct reflective uh, uh, indicator of good decisions that you made and bad decisions that you make. And I'm sorry if I'm preaching to somebody a little hard, but, but make some good decisions. Uh, lazy people soon uh, uh, are soon poor. Work hard at earthly routines, but also work hard to show God honor and to show God praises. Amen. Uh, being bulletproof, living long. I threw this one in here. Shane and I were in, in Africa, and we're protected by guys with AK-47s or whatever, AR-15s. And, and uh, it's kind of worrisome a little bit. But Shane said, hey, don't worry about it. As long as you're on a mission from God, you're basically bulletproof. Buddy, I hung on to that. And it eliminated my, my fear. And guess what? It, it created a new prayer in me. Father, don't get done with me yet. <laughs> Give me a new mission. Let me be doing something for the kingdom because I don't want to die yet. 
And uh, so anyway, I love that story. Number 15, work with excellence. I think it was David that had a spirit of excellence. Is that right, David? Anyway, excellence will get you a long way. And I'll give you a small example. Even your handwriting makes a difference. And I, I bid at a job in Carrollton for Pearl Center Vision, and I presented the the job task, what we're going to do, and then at the end I presented my invoice, uh, my proposal, and on my proposal I had put it together on a document my mother created, QuickBooks, and, and it was kind of nice, all on the computer, nothing handwritten, written, and I handed it in, and we, went, we wound up getting the job, and as we were doing the job, I was talking to the guy who owns, uh, who did own Pearl Vision Center in Carrollton, and uh, I said, tell me, was, you know, how, how much did we, how low was we compared to other guys? Was we the cheapest guy? You know, how bad did, we get, did I beat everybody? He said, oh, no, you was not the cheapest. Hmm. Normally I get the job because I was the lowest bidder. Well, what do you mean I wasn't the cheapest? He said, well, Caleb, to be quite honest with you, it was your presentation of excellence. I said, what do you mean? He said, the one thing that stood out in my mind, number one, was that you were informational. But number two was that you presented an invoice that was unlike anybody else, a proposal that was unlike anybody else. Everybody else had just hand scribbled, couldn't even hardly read their writing, he said. But yours was done with excellence. And I, I figured that if you took time to make your pr proposal have excellence, you'd probably take time to give my floor excellence. And so I was not the lowest bidder. Matter of fact, I was the highest. So let me tell you, excellence will increase your value. Being different, your, your value lies in your difference. I can't say that enough this morning. Your value is determined by your difference. You want to be different. You can be. Very easy. <clears throat> pray and ask God to give you excellence. When, I, when I'm cutting, I, we're doing some rubber stuff now lately that is very, very hard to cut. It's, it's all about feel. You can't look at it. I mean, I, I can't even explain how hard it is. But once you get the feel, you can do it pretty good. But it's so easy to cut short, so easy to cut long. So And it's so much muscle required that literally you cut a little bit and you stop to rest. You cut a little bit and you stop to rest. Do you know what I do when I stop to rest? I say, thank you, Jesus, for excellence. I cut a little bit more, thank you, Lord, for, for quality. Thank you, Lord, for the skill. Every breath, true story, I'm, pr I'm asking God to show me because I know if I can get it right the first time, I don't need to retrim it. If I, if I, I know I'm not going to cut short, but I know I can't do what I'm doing without the help of God. I'm, I'd like to take credit and say Caleb Gooden is just awesome. He is the man. But the truth is, is that the God that's in Caleb Gooden is the guy that's awesome. And by me being able to tap into his ability to give me excellence is where I have learned to succeed. Tap into it. Ask God to give you excellence. Amen. We have not because we ask not. That's another scripture. I didn't say that. That's scripture. Pray every breath. We're ambassadors of the kingdom, representatives. We have got to show off. Go the extra mile. I already talked about that a little bit. Give gifts to the boss. Be memorable. Number, I'm on 17 now, by the way. Be memorably pleasant to work with. I, I almost said that wrong. Be memorably, be remembered for being pleasant. It's time to shut up. I'll, I'll stop with this one. I don't care how good, how skilled you are, how talented you are. If you're a misery to be around, if you're old grumpy tail, old Scrooge, I do not want you working beside me. I'll pick the guy that has less skill, less talent, but more enjoyable to be beside me. So be memorable. Forgive is number 18 because we need forgiveness. Forgive. Uh, Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, if you're praying, first forgive, or uh, so that your, your Father in heaven will forgive your sins. If we don't forgive others, we don't even get forgiven. Unforgiveness will kill you. Forgiveness will heal you. It's a secret to a long, long life. Be thankful. I already told you about this one, and I'll end on this. Being thankful. The best praisers and worshipers are the ones who have the most to be thankful for. If you've had some bad days, some really bad days, the, the worst days that you've had, the more you'll have to be thankful for. So if you've had some struggles, you've had some 
trials and some tribulations. I just told you what James said. It's an opportunity to, to, to mature, to be perfect. But be, uh, make sure you continue to, uh, to be thankful. And I think that's it there. Uh, let's see. Make sure I didn't leave nothing out. This was some good stuff. The Levites, I was just going to share. I don't know if y'all read about the Levites, but in Second Chronicles, the Levites became in charge of the praisers. They had the most to be thankful for. But we'll close with this. <clears throat> be thankful for where he's brought you from. Be thankful for the new person, the new creature that you are. Be thankful for the disasters that we almost got ourselves into, but we didn't. Be thankful for the provision uh, when we didn't think we would have made it, God still provided. Be thankful for the foot that you have that, that can hurt. So many times we talk about the feet that hurt. Sister Jackie and Brother Allen was not here today, but she can't feel from her waist down. And one day she was in a wheelchair and she went up under the bed and when she pulled back out, it ripped the top of her foot off. And blood was everywhere through the house. And when Alan came into the house, he, he said, My goodness, honey, what has happened? Sister Jackie didn't even know that she had hurt her foot. And she, was, she could have bled to death. But, thank God, he had a different plan. But some of us talk about our feet hurting and we complain about our feet hurting. Well, let me tell you, you can do that until you look across the street and see the guy that don't have any feet. It can always be worse. Stop complaining and start praising God for the things that not only that you have, but the things that you should have that you didn't get. You see, mercy is when we don't get. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. Mercy is when we don't get what we did deserve. God is full of mercy. He's full of grace. And He wants us to live a life, not just with eternal life. In the hereafter, that's not just the blessing. That's not just the reward somewhere out yonder. Our blessings should start here today. We should be full of peace, full of joy, full of health. That's all the promises that God has given us. Amen. Amen. Ask for it. We have not before because we ask not. You want to be blessed? Ask God to show you. He's a teacher. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. He will teach you how to cut rubber. He'll teach you how to how to be enjoyable in your workplace. He'll teach you how to, how to just tap into those endless supplies of blessings, of mercy, of grace. Amen. Amen. Bow your head. Father, Lord, teach us, Lord, to honor you, to be a blessing. Father, to not just be so blessed for us, but to be blessed for others. Father, thank you for those hard days. Thank you for those trials and those tribulations and those tests. Lord, that, that help us to mature. Father, thank you for letting us understand, Lord, that you love us, you forgive us, and we did not do anything that surprised you, Father, that your cross, your blood that you shed covered everything, every sin that we did do, that we are doing, and that we might do later. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for loving us regardless in Jesus' name. Father, as these folks here today heard this message, Father, I ask that you'd let it stick to their ribs. Let it roll over in their minds over and over this week. Father, let them to look for ways to sow seeds. Let them look for ways to, to show honor. Father, let them look for, to ways, for ways, Lord, to show you that we are so thankful for all that you've done for us. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our shortcomings. Lord, if, if, if we're here today and we've not accepted you, Father, I ask that, that we would accept you. Father, maybe we've not walked that walk. We need to get back closer to you. Father, I ask that you would renew our relationship. Give us a revival in our spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord, let us go out of here today knowing that we're blessed because of you being our blessor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Give, give Brother Caleb a big hand. Amen. Good word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're happy that Caleb Jenny made it today and that uh, he made up for lost time. <laughs> Giving us a word. Amen. But it was a good word. It was... Uh, I want you to prepare to give. This is the good opportunity to practice what he just got through preaching. Let's prepare to give, and we're going to receive uh, communion at the same time. 
get your offering and everything ready. And I was, I, I was reminded when he was speaking about this yesterday, my grandson, seven-year-old, came in crying. He's playing with the, the neighbor who was a nine-year-old, and they decided to get in a 